to our Coco Heads talk. Um, we have uh, it's pre-recorded and it's not very technical, so it's maybe a little bit different than you guys are used to. Um, I'm Frank Boss, work on NS and at the NS Lab app. I'm an iOS developer and do a lot of Kotlin on the back end as well. And my name is Fuad Astitu. I am also an iOS developer in uh, the Lab app team. Uh, with some experience uh, in uh, AWS and uh, starting a little bit with backend development. Let's start by asking the question, what is clean architecture? Well, that depends on who you ask. If you Google the question, what is clean architecture, you'll find out that some people say it's a separation of concerns while others might say it's the way you organize or structure your code. In plain English, one could say that clean architecture refers to organizing a project in a way that is easy to understand and easy to change as the project grows. And how about the inventor of clean architecture? What is his take on this? Well, according to Uncle Bob, clean architecture is a software design philosophy a software design philosophy that separates the elements of design into ring levels. Well, what does he mean by this? Well, to help us developers visualize what he means by this, he provided us with this image. So we have this nice image then. So why does our talk say fuck clean architecture? Well, it mainly has to do with the trends that the industry is going on that we don't like. And we see it back in our code reviews. Sometimes people of our team or other teams will say, oh, this code is not following best practices. But best practices is very loosely defined and changes with trends. So if you're not following the latest bad practices, does it really mean you're doing bad practices? And also with clean code, people say, oh, the code is not clean. But does that mean the code is dirty? Because I would like, rather like the arguments of this code is not readable. I don't understand this code. I think you can do better instead of the argument clean code because clean code by itself doesn't say much. And then you have the separation of concerns where they say, oh, you haven't put this in the domain layer or you haven't put this in the controller layer. But sometimes separation of concerns just make code more complex. It doesn't have to be complex. Simple code is often better than more complex code just to have the argument separation of concerns. And I can tell you a little secret that we found with the Lab app is that in the end, your users don't care about your code. They care about if you solve their issues and if you solve their problems. And Ford is going to explain to you a little bit what the Lab app is about and what problems it was meant to solve. The development of the NS Lab app started back in 2017. The idea behind this app was to have a separate place where we could just experiment with new features or proof of concepts and ideas and validate that our users uh, would appreciate them before we would think of uh, taking those features to the main NS app. It started with a very small team, two full stack mobile developer and a part time product owner. When I joined the team a couple of months later, I think it was in September 2017, they had already a small uh, beta app, which was not released in the App Store yet. Two weeks after me, another developer joined our team, uh, an Android developer. By then, we were four of us. Shortly after, it was decided that we had to set up the project from the ground up. So we had a clean slate to start. So when you have a clean slate and you need to set up a new project, one of the things you have to do is figure out what kind of architecture you would use for your project. So when you start a new project, there are some decisions that you have to take. You'll have to think about the architecture that you want to use, design patterns, frameworks, the way you're going to structure your code. So how did we decide that? Well, back then it was actually easy. The idea of the iOS developer made a lot of sense. His idea was, why don't we just use the architecture and the design patterns and so on as the iOS NS app already is using? At the time, that sounded very logical because the NS app has millions of users, has proven 
to have a very good uh, and stable structure. So why wouldn't we copy that? <clears throat> so the decision was made to, to do that. That meant implementing and using Rx Swift. A huge part of the NS app is written actually in, in, in Rx Swift. Apart from Rx Swift, they mainly use MVVM as a design pattern. And for the navigation within the project, we decided to also use the hype of 2017, and that's the coordinator pattern, which were, came to life uh, through a blog post from uh, Mr. Kanlu. More on that later in our presentation. So when all this was clear, there was one thing for me personally left to do, and that's take a crash course Rx Swift because reactive programming was completely new to me and Rx Swift as a whole also. Looking into a couple of tutorials, uh, which didn't make any sense to me, I thought an Udemy course would, would change that. So I, 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 I got this course gifted I, I actually by the, by the other iOS developer and I went head first into, uh, into this course. And it all made sense while I was doing the course. So we started implementing Rx Swift in our project and sometimes just looking into the code base of the NS app when we couldn't uh, solve some issues that we were facing because of our poor knowledge and also the poor documentation of Rx Swift in 2017. But we had set up a project, it was working, the first features were being built. And our team was doing well, so we were talking about expanding the team. And that's uh, when short after my other colleague, Frank, joined us. I joined NS Lab App in March 2019. And the first appointment I got was to get to learn the code base, get to learn the project. And I had a few weeks before I had to work on actual production issues, which is often what NS does which was nice because I could go to the customer support, introduce myself and ask them what were the common complaints people had about the NS Lab app. And I could ask the developers what were the most common bugs in the code, in which area were they focused. So I had something to focus myself on in these few weeks to learn the code base, but actually being productive as well. So one of the most common bugs and even customer complaints all had to do with how our app gets a shared trip from the NS app. So from the NS app, you have to share a trip to the NS Lab app so we get all the data so we can start our journey there with the user. And how that works, you can see in the background here, is that you go to the NS app on your iPhone, you plan a trip from origin to destination, you go to the details of this one, and then you can share it to our app. And then following, we get all the data from this trip and we can actually guide the user on this trip live. The underwater, it uses user defaults to share certain information. And what it shares is a simple link to this trip, just like how you would share to Facebook or Instagram. The problem is that the NS Lab app has to use this link, connect to a cloud server to get the actual trip model as a JSON. And this has a lot of issues where people have very shitty internet, we understood in trains, especially in the middle of nowhere. So a lot of consumers complained that the delay between sharing a trip from one end to the other was, was too long and a lot of errors happened. And this introduced also a lot of weird edge cases that the developers had to solve. So what I did, I solved this by instead of sending just the trip over user defaults, why not just share the whole JSON? As both apps know this JSON, we can share it in between. And of course, this goes against all principles of clean architecture, because now I've coupled two apps and instead of separating concerns, I've now coupled them together. So if you change the JSON model in one app, you have to change the other one. But for the users, this is the right behavior. And in the end, that's all what matters, that the users think it's a good way of handling it. One of the other things I started worrying about is the way protocols were used to define their view models. They had a, a protocol for the input of a view model, the output of a view model, and then one protocol to combine the two. And then the actual implementation code had to inherit from all these three protocols and then had to use a lot of boilerplate to make this work. And this also introduced subtle mistakes people could make where they could use the input as an output or the output as an input or vice versa. 
also using behavior subjects since then is quite bad practice now because you're encapsulating state where it doesn't have to be encapsulated. But what was my solution? So fortunately, one month before I started my assessment, I read this blog post that was published on 18 February that shows this way of making view models that Fuad and Ricardo has done back then. And also introduces some other ways to do it. Some other ways developers has learned that is a better way to do it. So I started changing some new features into this way and asked Fuad and Ricardo if they like it, they liked it more. So we now adopt this pattern where you don't need the protocols, you just need structs and you can still test it, it's still unit testable. What we try to say here is that Fuad and Ricardo did nothing wrong, they just followed the trend too early. And if you follow a trend too early, you're the one to fall on all the pitfalls. So in our opinion, it's always better to look for the new trends, keep updated, but don't introduce them in big production apps. And then a little funny was that the, it was good that Fuad and Ricardo didn't choose to implement the coordinator pattern in the NSLAP just as the NS app has done. Because a few months later, Kanlu made a blog post about how his initial coordinator pattern still had a lot of issues and he solved them. But it was too difficult to have this production app based on this one pattern to change it and make the better implementation work. Then a little over a year ago, it was decided that we should expand our team and we started looking for an additional iOS developer. We found one. Let's call him Bob. Bob had previously worked for a very large Dutch company that mainly used test-driven development for their uh, software development. After having a look in our code base, Bob came to us with several questions. Among them, what design patterns do we use? Well, that's an easy one. We showed him this picture, MVVM. But, but what does the S stand for, he asked. Well, the S stands for sometimes. We use MVVM through our project, but sometimes, not everywhere. And how about navigation? How do you do that in your app? Can't seem to find any router or coordinator. We use the UI navigation controller. The next day, when Bob came to work, he brought something with him. Something that he wanted to share with us. It was a book. It was the clean architecture book from Uncle Sam. He asked us, do you know this book? Yes, we do. What do you think about this book? Well, that's what we think about this book. This left poor Bob puzzled. He then asked, but do you guys manage to, do, to deliver any new features to do any new releases? Sure we do, a lot of them. Just in the last quarter, we have implemented several shared mobility types within our app, which you can reserve using uh, deep links. We have implemented a complete new OFA Fits feature, which was meant to be a standalone app. Before that, it got implemented in our app. We've created uh, a library uh, that's called uh, vehicle detection, which determines where uh, in which train a user is without having to input information. It does that just by using a user's location. We've implemented uh, the swipe in, swipe out feature. This is a proof of concept that we're currently working on, which will enable uh, users later on to be able to travel only with their uh, mobile device, uh, not having to use the OFA chip card anymore. And we've even managed to build our first Swift UI widget. Bob was still a bit confused by all this. He then asked, but do you guys have any CI or CD system? Yes, we use Bitrise. It's not working anymore. So we're just archiving the projects ourselves. How about unit tests? Yes, we have unit tests. They're broken. We don't fix them. We don't have a lot of unit tests, but we've managed without them. But most importantly, we have happy users. We have a very good rating in the App Store. The feedback that we get from our users is very positive. So we think we're doing a great job. So how do you make it work? So we started arguing with him that the word foundation is wrong because why does the whole app need the same foundation? Because this term is taken from architecture and buildings in real life. 
But buildings in real life rarely get the job to implement a rooftop pool after the building has been built. Often these specs are available at the beginning. Okay, sometimes they do do it, but then buildings collapse. But we often get a project manager that likes the building we built, likes the feature we built, and he's like, I, I really like this view. Can you build a pool on the roof? And this is possible as long as you make your foundation very small. And it's just for that little building, then we can still strip out the foundation, build a new one, which is equal to deleting all the code and building the new code, but leaving the top of the code standing. But it becomes very complicated when you have like a massive foundation for like a skyscraper. You cannot just strip the foundation while the skyscraper is still standing. And in iOS terms, this is often one of those patterns is Viper. Viper is a very complex architecture, but it does separate all your concerns very nicely. And it might make sense for some features. And one of those features is that we have in the NS app that we build as NSLab is train detection widget. So there's a widget on your home screen and using GPS and Wi-Fi, we can detect in which train you are so we can give you the relevant information so you don't have to find the information about the train anymore. But then it started as a very simple, just UI feature, have a backend, but then the privacy office games. And as everyone knows as developers, the privacy office often makes very simple things very complicated because we had to deal with user authentication, opt-ins. What if your user has location, but you haven't enabled privacy? precise location in iOS 14. So quickly the flowchart of the designer became more and more complex and there's a lot of UI elements that have to be shown at the right time in the right circumstances. And sometimes the user can disable this feature from different screens, navigate to it from different screens. So in this case, having a router or interactor or using like hints from the Viper design definitely makes sense. But we would argue that doesn't mean our whole app has to be built on Viper. Because we had another feature, which was basically a list of questions in the table view, which is very simple to everyone's create your first app, iOS app um, design. So why make it more complicated than what people are doing in their first month of learning iOS development? Because even if you ask the designer for the flow, it's still very linear. You just go from the left to the right. There's a few options to filter the screen. But apart from that, it's really not that complex. So why use a complex foundation? Why not go back to the original MVC model that Apple introduces and highlights? Because even your junior developers will all understand it. Even though, funny enough, since we made this presentation, Apple says now that this may not represent the best practices for current development. But I think they put down all the documentation that's old, even though the old documentation is generally better. And it becomes even more simpler than Apple makes it out because your UV, UI view controller often combines both the view and controller of MVC. But this is perfectly fine for a feature that's basically a list of questions. And once you click on the question, it opens a detail page. If I've done this in Viper, I would have made the code a lot more abstract and complicated than it has to be. And Rutger was like, yeah, but does your whole app not need to fit in have the same rules and we argue against this and we began explaining this by having a little look at the NASA code base guidelines and one of those guidelines is that all their codes needs to have five different static code analyzers that give them warnings and all those warnings must be fixed. This led them to compiling at night because this compiling and analysis took 15 hours which is ridiculous for an iOS app and everyone knows that because for a simple Christmas app that's only for 2020, why would you follow all these strict rules if you want to release on time? So everyone can get that, that certain apps need certain kind, types of rules, just like the NS app and the NSLab app. It seems like our NSLab app users are a little bit more experimental and will accept mistakes. But we want to go one step further and is that inside an app, there's different issues to be solved. Because if a marker here on the map disappears because of a glitch is a lot less strict than if someone cannot enter their over chip card. Or in the NSAP case, if that ticket that they just paid for get lost into the void. So why build these features in the same way? And just like we said, make small foundations for your features and only use large foundations when it makes sense. Because small foundations are easy to change, but large ones are not. So one of those features that we have in the NS app that helped by starting small and 
growing big is the train detection widget I showed you earlier. So the first implementation was very simple. We just find all the trains nearby in a circle around the user and then do a series of if checks based on these trains. And if the first one matches, then you must be in that train, which worked. And when we did the initial surveys using Instabook, where if someone gets detected in a train, we automatically ask them, what did you think about this? We got quite a high regard, but often we still often did it quite wrong. Especially when multiple trains were leaving the station at the same time, we would often give the information of the wrong train. So we knew we had still some steps to do, but because we had such great user feedback, we got time to do these steps. So instead, we just did the simple check again around the user location where we find the trains nearby. But instead of doing a simple series of if statements, we did some simple linear algebra to do weighted scores where you can see one function here. Um, so we had all the three parameters between the train and the user, speed, bearing, and distance. We did some scoring based on them, and then we weighted them all together, and we got a final score for each train. And then we could sort the list of trains on the highest score, and that must be the train the user is in. And this worked very well, except we introduced a lot of magic constants, such as the score weighting, that people, especially new employees, would start to tweak based on their commute, so their train would always work, which was a problem because to change those numbers, because they were in an iOS app, you always had to do a new release, and often it would break other people's commutes as well. So we knew we had to do a better way. We had to move this scoring algorithm to an API, make an SDK so both the NS app and the NS lab app could use the same code base, so we could start making it better. And we did that by saving a lot of scenarios of people as well. So we started saving scenarios in the past of actual GPS points a phone has gotten and which train they should have been in. So we could replay the scenarios and validate if the scoring changes that people have done were good. So we could start slowly start moving to a more complex system that would get more of these scenarios right. And we currently have like about a 10K of scenarios in our backend that we can check against. So every time we need to make a change, we can now confidently make the change knowing that more scenarios will succeed. So this is one of those features where it was handy that we started with a very small seed, checked those with the users, made very simple code, and grow the code bigger and bigger and more complex. Because it's often easier to grow code more complex than to reduce complexity in existing code. And this worked for Bob because he started believing it. To conclude our talk, we'd like to end with the following takeaways. Don't follow trends too early because you enter a relatively unknown territory. And it's good to adhere to clean architecture principles, but keep in mind that a lot of the times this leads to over-engineering features or projects. A very smart developer also once said that architecture architecting for the enterprise when all you really need is a cute little desktop tool is a recipe for failure. Who was this developer you might ask? Well, it was Uncle Bob in his clean architecture book. This concludes our uh, talk. We uh, hope you enjoyed uh, listening to our uh, presentation and uh, we hope that uh, we managed to give you a different perspective in uh, the way you can look at uh, implementing clean architecture within your own projects. Thank you very much, and we hope you all have a good evening. Thanks for letting us do this talk. I saw one guy, Mario, <laughs> he agrees with us, as always good to know. I saw you're an architect as well, so it's good we have some architects in the industry that um, <laughs> they'll keep things small when you have to. I also saw a question by Piotr. I hope you, I pronounced your name correctly. How to deal with API changes in Viper. Um, I think I've, I've seen other apps do it where they just basically copy the file, put a version one or version two behind it, and then slowly when it's done, they remove the versions. If it works, why not?
And then for what, how many people do as Anislab now? I think uh, our PO uh, answered already in the chat. He says about 2,000 weekly active users. So that's a lot. Yeah, and it helps. Uh, I don't have stock in Instabuck, but <laughs> we do use Instabuck a lot to get like one on one feedback from users because our customer support guy, Tio, he can actually chat with them and ask them more questions. So we get quite nice feedback that big apps often don't have. That is good as well that Carlos also agrees with us. Are there any people that are silent but completely would never agree with us? No way. Like the, <laughs> the Uncle Bob cult followers. Do we have any of them <laughs> online? Because we are here for you. Because the main reason why we want to do this. We're here to, to rescue you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the main reason, yes. yes. And when I joined um, iOS development, it was a very nice sort of corner of the software development world. And this, the Uncle Bob following wasn't like really infiltrated yet. But now uh, you see it more and more. And especially when you move to like not iOS, but like backend development, how often I see like static websites use Kubernetes to like make it massively scalable, even though, you know, we only got 100 users a day. It's like, it drives me crazy. Uh, for Pratam, Pratamesh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Yes, Enes is hiring. Uh, I think at the end of the presentation, there's a link to the, uh, uh, the openings. But uh, just leave Uncle Bob at home. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, I see one more question from Pim Nyman. Uh, would this scale to larger apps? Uh, yes, we do think so. Because it's always easy to go from small to large, and it's never hard to go from large to small. So begin small, get feedback from your users, scale slowly up, and eventually we'll get a big code base. Everyone gets a big code base. But at least it grows to your needs instead of the other way around. Yeah. And for Ronald, yeah, completely agree. They, it's what we usually also do. This was just to, to show uh, that uh, we don't have a real structure removing them when they break. Usually uh, we just forget to run them. And then when we run them once, one or two breaks, and then we figure out at that time if we keep the, the the test and make it work again or we just completely delete it if we've never missed it then we have a question from stein which is very relevant to ourselves because the purpose of our app is to experiment with new features and move them over to the ns app um, we've done that with two features by now um, and it, it mainly has to do with if the business likes the features we make and if users like it so there has to be some connection between the business and users both liking the features that we just didn't experiment with and then slowly moving it over. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we find out we're doing the wrong things. Um, we got a lot of scooters at the moment in our app, like from check and go sharing. And we get a lot of complaints about them. People hate the fucking advertisement for scooters. Um, <laughs> so um, we're trying to find different ways to sort of highlight those in the app. And some people really like them. Yeah, they're growing very fast. So they're doing something good. Yeah, I have fit in so it is before releasing. Uh, to answer Mario Negro Ponzi's uh, question, <laughs> we just uh, uploaded the test flight build and we uh, we run through it, and we hope that uh, everything that uh, was working before is still working, and we test the feature nine nine times out of ten, it uh, works very good for us at least. So, but we, 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 we um, as, as part of the team, the developers, we, we feel really responsible for the work that we deliver for the features. So uh, we test them ourselves and then we ask some uh, colleagues to test them before we release them. And we have uh, 
a very keen product owner also that we ask to to um, to test before we release a new build. So generally, that works uh, great. And then Piotr has a follow up question: Is like, um, do we have a mix of every design pattern in our app, or is it like a dominant one? So the dominant one is definitely MVVM with RX Swift because it kind of leans towards that. But every new feature we discuss within the iOS developer team. So I discussed with Fuad and Sharia, who just joined us a few months ago. Um, would it make sense to use MVVM in this sense? Or do we go back for classic MVC because it's just a lot simpler? And does the feature in the future needs to imp like interact with more parts of the app than just leave it simple if that's not the case? Exactly. You need to follow some kind of architecture, but you shouldn't try to implement the same template for anything that you do in, in, in your app and just stay critical. And, uh, you know, we, we work with, with uh, Git flow and pull requests and we are critical to each other in a, in a positive way by, uh, sometimes also discussing a new feature before implementing it. Uh, I would, I would, uh, approach, uh, Frank about the idea that I have the way that I would want to implement it and see if he would agree in that stage already to use MVVM or not to use it or whatever. And from then on, if, if we all agree, we just implement it. Then Pratt has a question about how we detect the closest trends. So we, um, do that based on GPS of the users. And sometimes on iOS, if you connect to a Wi-Fi point in the train, we can use that to get really accurate train detections. Um, on Android, we can always do that because Android doesn't care about privacy of users. You can just scan every Wi-Fi point around you and like track people that way, which is a lot handier for us because we can do very nice detections. But it's mainly based around GPS and some algorithm someone in our team wrote um, and running a lot of tests on new, new scenarios of users. And Dennis, yes, onboarding. It depends on your uh, experience level. If you know reactive programming, shouldn't be uh, very difficult to uh, onboard as a new developer within our team, also within the NS app team itself. If you understand the concept of uh, reactive programming, you're flexible and you're keen to learn and uh, you're assertive. There shouldn't be shouldn't be any problem to onboard within uh, one of our uh, two teams. We do find Eric Swift to be tough to onboard people in that have never had experience with it. It's got a very few um, easy pitfalls to fall into that you need to know and basically have experience with, otherwise you don't know them. That can lead to very frustrating bugs. Uh, to answer Shervin's uh, question, no, definitely not. You know, we know what we are doing. And we know that we are not uh, releasing uh, within an app that is that is that has a very very huge base. Like the NS app, um, they would be helped maybe to approach some of the features they develop the way we do, but they have a, a different user base. They have two million people using the app, so they can't uh, they can't permit themselves to 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 do the things the way we do but on the other hand you know it depends also on the feature if the feature is you know if if it doesn't matter if the feature is implemented with a small bug and it doesn't really affect let's say your travel information or or so on so as soon as we catch it or as soon as a user points out points it out to us you know, we'll have a new build within a day that's also our flexibility that's also what happens and it's uh, a user we, we release a new build a user points out a bug if we think it's severe enough the same evening even if i'm not at work i'll fix the big uh, the the bug and and release a new uh, a new build that's the way that, that we try to handle it. Also to tell Sherwin, he had a question. Since you released by hoping everything is fine, would you have surgery at a medical center, which is the same motto? Definitely not. Um, <laughs> but we're not making a medical app. If I was making a medical app, I would make sure that it always works and that would do a lot more like uh, testing as well. But we also get more time to do that. 
I hope. Otherwise, I will not take the job. Um, and that's kind of what we want to say in this talk. Like, if you're not making a medical grade app, don't try to pretend you're doing one. If you're not making a Google.com, don't pretend you are making a Google.com. The These majority of us aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for um, listening to us. And uh, I hope we agreed some people to take a more simpler approach in life in general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you have exactly. questions after this talk, just uh, put them in the Slack of Coco Heads. I think it's on the stage here. I see it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks all for joining us and giving us this uh, opportunity. And uh, we hope that you could uh, plant some seeds in your minds. And uh, good luck with uh, all your own projects.